So thank you, thank you everyone for attending. I know it's Friday, it's a bit late, so really appreciate it. I hope it's, it will be an interesting talk and you learn something new. So let's start. The talk is about implementing MTLS in Istio multi-cluster environments using Aspire. My name is Samu Veloso. I'm a software engineer at Solo.io, where I'm building a multi-cluster service mesh based on Istio and Envoy. Yeah, my name is Edu Bonilla. I am customer success engineer in Solo.io, uh, working on with open source technologies, Istio, Envoy, Aspire. So hope you like the talk. Okay, let's start from the beginning. So what is MTLS? Most of you probably already know it, but for those that don't know it, let's start. So most of you probably are familiar with TLS. It's a traditional protocol used by many websites to encrypt the traffic. So in TLS, the client has to validate the server from the certificate in order to establish an encrypted communication. With MTLS, both the client and the server authenticate each other. So in this case, also the server has to uh, validate and authenticate the client certificate in order to establish an encrypted communication. This is more powerful because with MTLS, you can define policies and restrict the access to your server only to some specific clients. So in order to establish or uh, yeah, to use MTLS, you need to generate a client certificate and a, a certificate and a key for your client and for your server, for both of them. So this is simple if you only have two apps, a client and a server, but in enterprise environments that you are probably more familiar with, with Kubernetes environments, they are really dynamic. They, the pods are being recreated uh, very often. So in order to handle the certificates, it's, you have to use some, some kind of tool because it's impossible to handle this mess just with uh, with manual actions. So the technology that we are going to show that solves this, this problem is SPIFI and Aspire. Okay, so let's review first what is SPIFI and later we will review Aspire. So SPIFI stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. It's an open source standard for securely identifying software system in dynamic environments. So basically, a spiff is just uh, a standard. Okay, it will it talks about how to design your uh, your system to be compliant with the spiffy. So there are several concepts involved in a spiffy architecture that I'm going to to go through. The first one is the workload API. The workload API is in charge of generating a, a document called SVID. I'm going to talk about a lot about SVIDs. So. SBID is a verifiable identity document. Uh, it's a document that the workloads are going to use to establish the MTLS communications because inside the SBID, we are going to put an SPFID. Okay, so the SPFID identifies a specific workload within a trust domain. All the workloads running, for example, in a cluster, the cluster will be the trust domain as, as we will be, uh, as we will see later with Edu because we are going to have two different clusters, so we will have two different trust domains. And the SPFID is just URI compliant, okay? It's, you have to put inside the SPFID, the trust domain, and also the workload ID. And the workload ID depends a lot on your environment configuration. So the important thing, uh, thing here is the SBID. So the SBID, there are two different formats of SBID. We have the X509 certificate and the JOT token. The X509 certificate is preferred over, over JOT tokens. So in the rest of the talk, we are only going to speak about when we talk about SBIDs, we are going to talk about only X509 certificates. And it's a certificate generated by the workload API with the SPFI ID inside of the SBID. And for example, as you can see there, okay, it's a normal certificate, an X509, but in the extensions, in the subject alternative name, we are putting this PFID inside there, okay? So the workload API will return the SBID, the private key, and the bundle of the CA of the trust domain to the workload. And the workload will use that information in order to uh, be validated by other workloads in the, in the trust domain. And as the talk is about multi-cluster, we, we are going to have different trust domains and every trust domain has to trust the, its other, the rest of the trust domains. So uh, SPFI 
uh, declares the you have to expose or every workload API has to expose the trust bundle, which is the public information of the certification authority that is issuing the certificates uh, to the to the rest of the trust domains. So uh, in, with the trust bundle information, you can federate your trust domains into each other, as we will review later in the in the demo. So this is a Spiffy, and now Spire is just one implementation of Spiffy. Okay? There are several others, but here we are going to, to review Spires. Okay, so in Spire it's more complex the architecture. We now instead of having only the workload API, we now have an agent and a server. So the agent will generate the SBID for the workloads uh, in a process known workload attestation. Okay. In order to do that, we, ne we need first to register the different workload entries in the with the registration API that you have just in there into the server, okay? And the server will store these identities into a database. There are different, in Aspire, it supports several different storage backends, okay, with the dat data store plugins that you can define. And the same with the certification authority, as the server has to generate uh, certificates for the different SBIDs, uh, we need to use a uh, CA plugin. So it, you can use just an external certification authority. By default, it will auto-generate a certification authority that will use to generate the certificates. So that's the server, and now uh, the agent, in order to be able to trust the server and vice versa, also the server has to trust the agent the agent will be authenticated, okay? If this process is not at the station. So we are going to see how this works, okay? It's these three parts, the registration API, the node at the station, and the workload at the station uh, in Kubernetes. So the first thing is how we register our workloads with Aspire in a Kubernetes environment. So in the Aspire server, that's a pod running, okay, in the Aspire system namespace, and inside the Aspire system pod, we have two different containers. We have the Aspire server itself, and the controller manager. So this controller manager is uh, continuously watching for pods that match this specification in the cluster SPF ID custom resource. So we define, for example, a pod selector. So only the pods with these labels can be registered in the Spire server database. And the SPF ID that will be generated for that workloads will match the, what we define in the SPF ID template. In this case, it's the trust domain, the namespace of the workload, and the service account of the workload. Okay, this is what we are going to, this format is we are using with, with Istio uh, later on. So once the workloads are registered into the Aspire server, we need the agent to uh, grab or to get this, uh, this, the SVIDs for, for this workload. So this is what is node attestation, okay? The Spire agent or the Spire server needs to trust the Spire agent and just uh, only trust the Spire agents to avoid others to impersonate the Spire agent and, uh, and return the SVIDs to, to a different agent, okay? So the Spire agent will generate a CSR, a certificate signing request, and it will use the service account token of the Spire agent. The Spire agent is a daemon set running on on Kubernetes, on every node, there is a, an Spire agent running with a service account. With that service account, the Spire server, so here we need a, a TLS communication, okay, because we are sending a confidential data, the service account token, to the Spire server, so this communication uh, has to be secured. And with that uh, token, the Spire server will go to the Kubernetes API, and with the token review API, will grab the the information, the metadata for the agent. And with that information, it will register the agent into the Spire server database. It will generate also an SPFID, but in this case, the format is pretty much different because in this case, the format uh, is based on the plugin that you are using to register the agent. For example, in this, uh, in this case, it's Kubernetes projected service account because we are using just the, the, the path of the service account token. And the selectors are retrieved from the token review API, and the selector are used just to identify the agent inside the database. So once we have this, once we register the agent, we are going to generate an SBID for the agent that the agent will use to establish an MTLS communication with the server 
and now it's going to cast, it's going to retrieve all the SVIDs for the workloads running on that node from the server, and it, they will be cast in the, in the agent. And finally, how now the workloads get that SVID from the, from the Spire agent, okay? So in this case, the workload, okay, a workload is just running on that same node of where the Spire agent is running, and they are going to, be, to communicate with a unit socket. So that unit socket is gonna be mounted by a different component, the Spire CSI driver. The Spire CSI driver will mount this Unix socket into the workload, and the workload is going to use this Unix socket to communicate with the Spire agent. The Spire agent is exposing in this Unix socket a gRPC API, uh, and the workload is gonna request at this, this endpoint, the Spiffy workload API, the, the SBID. So the agent is going to get the PID from the workload, the process ID, because that information cannot be impersonated. Uh, the workload doesn't decide the PID. You cannot set the PID when you are creating a workload. So that's unique. And with the PID, it's going to get from the kernel, from the, from the C groups, the container ID and the pod UID for that workload. And from the kubelet API running in that node, the kubelet that is running, it's going to get the rest of the information, the selectors that we are using to register the workload into the Spire server and from the list of SBIDs available in the agent. So with that selector, with that information, it's going to get the SBID and it's going to return finally the SBID to the workload that we'll use to establish MTLS in, in the trust domain. So that's a bit of theory about uh, Spire and Spiffy, how it works. So now Edu is going to show you in action how all of this works and how to set up a multi-cluster environment with all of this. Uh, thanks, Samu. So now yeah, I am going to talk about how you can integrate Spire and Ist in action in a real environment, and then I'm going to show a real-time demo. So first of all, I'm going to make like a high overall architecture of our demo, which is composed of two Kubernetes clusters, Istio Cluster 1 and Istio Cluster 2. And in each of them, we will deploy one Spire server in order to get the domain of each cluster. Then we will deploy one Spire agent per cluster because this demo is only done with one Kubernetes node. So it's one Spire agent per node. Also, both Spire servers will be in communication between them because we will federate the bundles from each them. So in order to uh, know which applications are in each cluster and in order to be able to establish communication between them, we are going to create a mess thanks to Istio. Uh, so we will deploy Istio in a multi-cluster architecture using the same network. So every application will be deployed in network one and we will deploy then some apps as you can see here in the image. So we will have our East Ingress Gateway from which our users will access. Then the users, the users will be routed to our front-end application, which is product page, and from product page to the back-end applications. So let's see the flow. Users come to the Ingress Gateway, front-end, and from front-end, they will be to the back-end. Also, just for some observability for the demo purpose, we have deployed also Prometheus on each cluster in order to get the metrics uh, from the traffic of the applications. These metrics will be federated into Thanos and we will show some observability using Kali. So first of all, let me talk to you about the Istio multi-cluster architecture. In this case, we are deploying both clusters in the same network and the way that Istio upstream has to discover the services deployed on the other cluster is by making requests to the API server. This is why we will use this command, which basically creates a secret in cluster one, let's say, which contains the cube config so that Istio D is able to communicate with the API server of cluster one. This way, all the applications, all the services in cluster one will be aware of which services are running also in the second cluster. So we can establish a direct communication between service A and service B. So how, how have we set up this in Istio? So basically we are deploying a multi-cluster architecture. We define here the name of our cluster. Both of them will have the same mesh ID and both of them will be running on the same network. Uh, also, we have to specify the trust domain for each cluster and we have to make also this modification, trust domain aliases, in order for the applications in cluster one to trust also the 
applications from task domain cluster two. So now that, now that we have East to Multicluster, let's go with Aspire Federation. So how does this work in Kubernetes environment? So we have Aspire server from cluster one and from cluster two, and we need each one to communicate with each other in order to fetch the bundles from the other cluster. So for that, we will enable Federation, and we can establish the template of the SPCAD template, which consists on the trust domain, the namespace, and the service account of the application. Uh, this can be modified, but uh, this was done for the demo. This will federate with Istio Cluster 2. So here for each federated domain, we can establish like some variables. So the trust domain of the federated cluster and the bundle endpoint URL. This URL will be pointing to the Kubernetes service of Aspire Server 2 in order to fetch the bundle from it and have all the identities available also from this cluster. So now that we have Eastern Multicluster and Aspire Federation, let's see how do both integrate together. So before explaining that, I'm going to explain how to explain how does Eastern do it in order to get the certificates for each workload. And uh, you need to know that each workload in Istio contains two containers. One of them is the application container, and the other one is the Istio proxy container. Istio proxy container is formed by two components, which are Istio agent and Envoy. What Istio agent does is basically bootstrapping the proxy and provisioning identities to the workloads. How does it do it? It makes a certificate signing request to Istio D, then Istio D signs the certificate, and uh, Istio agent and Envoy communicate thanks to this secret discovery service, which is called SDS, which is basically a Unix domain socket. So Envoy is able to talk with the SDS through SDS uh, Envoy API, and it can get the certificate and the keys, which will be stored on Envoy on memory. So now that we know how does Istio do it, let's see how does Aspire and Istio do it together. So instead of having the Istio agent uh, communicating with Envoy via SDS, we will establish direct communication between the Aspire agent and Envoy using SDS. How will we do it? So in the installation of Istio, we set some uh, webhooks so that every workload from Istio that will be deployed, thanks to the CSI driver that is um, in the node thanks to Aspire, we will mount this CSI on a known location in the workload. So the Aspire agent and Envoy will be communicating uh, via socket in the same node thanks to the server discovery service. So this is the way that we will provision the certificates to Envoy. Uh, so how does Aspire do its time we deploy a Istio workload in our cluster? As Sam explained before, we have the Istio controller manager, which is in charge of checking which workloads or which identities, which workloads are created on our cluster and reconciling them. So in this case, we are checking the logs. So Istio Aspire controller manager saw that this pod was deployed on our cluster and it didn't have an identity. So it creates an entry on the Aspire server with SPVD selectors and the domain which is federates with. Uh, then if we check on the other container, the Aspire server, the entries, we can see that we create one entry for each identity on our Aspire server. In this case, it's the identity also of our booking for product page application with the entry D, SPVD, the same that we defined before, the parent ID, which will be the Aspire agent, also the SVIDs, and this is interesting because we are also able to define some selectors in order to identify our workload. In this case, this is the default installation, so we only have the pod UID, which is the same uh, that you can check in the YAML of the pod running in Kubernetes. We can also uh, customize this by adding more selectors to the identity of each workload. And also we have to say that this will federate with Istio Cluster 2. How does the configuration in Envoy look? So uh, this means that Envoy will have uh, two sans, two subject alternative names created for each certificate, which will match both domains for the same uh, workload. So for booking for product page, we will have the certificates matching the SPVD from Istio Cluster 1 and Istio Cluster 2. Also, if we check on Envoy, the trust domains, it will trust certificates from both bundles coming from the Spire servers. So now let's go with the demo. Uh, first of all, yeah, you have here the repo that we use for this demo. 
Uh, it is public and it's very easy to install. With kind, we have made make a make file, so you can easily deploy it on your on your environment. Okay, so I'm going to show you what do we have in each cluster. We have two contexts. So if we go to kind is to cluster one, you can see that we have in booking for the front end application and also the back end. We have the Istio ingress gateway in Istio system, the Istio decontent plane, and the observability components, which are Kiali, Prometheus, and Thanos. Also in Spire, you can see that we have the Spire agent and the Spire server. So let's go to Istio cluster 2. As you can see, we have all the backend applications to which we will make the call from the front end. We have also Prometheus for observability, the Istio D control plane, the Spire agent and the Spire server. So let me make let, let me make this screen bigger. Okay. So apart from that, we have added also more security uh, in order to make the demo like more interesting for in the security aspect. And is that we have added some JOT policies to the Istio Ingress Gateway. So we are only accepting JOTs uh, that are signed by this certificate. You can see it also in the repo. We are extracting the JOT token from this URL. So we are getting this JOT token. And we have also exposed the gateway using uh, HTTPS with a certificate. So we will also need to specify one certificate in order to go through uh, our Istio Ingress Gateway. So basically, this will be our JOT token. We have here the issuer and the subject, which is testing secure.istio.io. And we will only allow JOTs uh, with this issuer and subject. As you can see here, uh, in the request authentication, we are specifying the certificate. And here, in the authorization policy, we are specifying the request principles. So let's make the test. If we make the test with the right token, it works. If we try to make it with a fake token, we get JOT issuer not configured. So it's like an extra step for configuring the security of our gateway. Also, another thing that you can do for security playing with the SPFI IDs is adding some authorization policies. In this case, for example, we say that only booking for product page, which is our front end, will be able to access our backend application reviews with this method and with this path. So any other application that tries to access this reviews backend application will be denied. So let's make the test. If we try to cool from the sleep pod the reviews application, we are not able to make any request to this pod. So this is another way to play with security and SPFI IDs. Now I'm going to let um, Now I'm going to let a for loop run in here, which every two seconds will make a request to our Eastern Ingress Gateway. And also if we check the logs that they have here, we are able to see what in the request is coming to to our to our AppSync service. So, yeah, so, it, so it's here, as you can see, uh, this is the SPFI ID of our upstream application. So I'm making the request to book info details with this SPFI ID. You can see the hash that we have for the data, the certificate that it's been forwarded with the organization, uh, the URI, and also the SPFI ID from the application that made the request. If we check this into a graph, we are using Kelly for this one we are able to see all the flow of our communication. So this box is for Istio Cluster 1, this one is for Istio Cluster 2, and let's display also the security. We can see that all the communication is encrypted. If we click on any of them, we see that MTLS is enabled, and we can see also the SPFID that is making the request and the one that is receiving it. So the SPFID that is making the request, in this case, is booking for product page, and the one that is receiving it is booking for reviews. So everything is encrypted. And just to make a double check, we get uh, I have a sniff pod running. And we also got some data into Wireshark. So this is the IP of the SUS node. And this is the IP of the pod application. This is the request. This is the response. And this is the ACK of the request. As you can see, everything is ciphered uh, using MTLS. And if we check the transport layer security, it's encrypted application data. 
Yeah, so that was the demo, different ways of securing your, your mess, your clusters using also these PFDs. So we hope that you like it. Uh, we have here some references that we used uh, for this talk in case that you want to, to check it. We have also submitted these slides into the schedule of KubeCon and here we are going to let also the QR code uh, just to leave us some feedback. So we hope that you enjoyed it. So any questions, just feel free to ask. Yes, we have a mic just in the center. Great. Hello, thank you for the presentation. I want to know how uh, certificate rotation is managed when you have this uh, multi-cluster setup. Is it managed by Spire and not by issue itself? Yeah, in this case it's managed by Spire and you can configure just the rotation period. So yeah, you can rotate it uh, every hour or what you prefer. Okay, one more there. Uh, yeah, hello, hi. Um, what would something change if you have chosen a different network architecture than you chose? Because you have the same network, two, two clusters in the same network. Uh, if I have another not network and something like that, what, what would change? Uh, the, so nothing would change for Aspire, it would change for Istio. So uh, in order, you are not able to access the API server of the remote cluster because you don't have, you are not talking in the same network, but you would have to deploy an east-west gateway in order to be able to do that pass-through and go through the services. So it would change the architecture of Istio, but not the one from Aspire. You would have to, to deploy also the east-west component. But I mean, so um, the, the Aspire will still be trusted even though you are uh, uh, communicating through a different um, gateway, right? Because you will now communicate throughout uh, east-west gateway, not by, not by ingress anymore, but that, that, that would work normally. The yeah, Spire will be also trusted because it's, uh, the Spire will federate the bundle from the other cluster. So as long as both the Spire server has both bundles, the east-west gateway will do a pass-through so it will forward also the same certificates. Yeah. It's running past through, that, that, that's correct, sorry. In this reference right here, the uh, istio.io docs, you have all the different multi-cluster configurations and yeah, all of them are supported. Thank you. Okay, one more right there, I can see one hand. Yeah, um, I was just wondering in terms of like use cases, the, I guess, benefits of having like multiple trust domains over like a single trust domain with like one root of trust. Um, like when do you see one versus the other? Like what would you advise? Yes, it's a very good question. I think, it's, I think it depends on the company. I mean, on your business logic, that's gonna define everything. Uh, I don't know, maybe just uh, one department is going to be one trust domain and the other, it depends on your on, on your organization, the different components and the relationships between these, or, uh, these departments. I think it depends a lot on your business logic or business domain. Thanks uh, for the talk. How is under the, oh. is the, the Spire server is the SPOF or it is possible to have height availability on it? Is it what? Can you repeat the question, please? It's a Single ah. point of failure. Uh, it supports, in our case, yes, because the, it's a, just a demo, but it supports high availability uh, configuration. So, and it, actually you can deploy it outside of Kubernetes in a different, actually it's a, a very important, uh, it's a component that it has to be in a very, it has to be very secure. I mean, you need, so you can just deploy it outside of Kubernetes in a virtual machines with hardening and just in high availability. The same with the database. I mean, in our case, we are just using a SQLite inside the Kubernetes pod, but in production, you are going to, you want to use a Postgres outside with all replication and in a production way. So, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Cool. Um, in your example, you showed that the two Istio clusters are across um, a single network, uh, like, and so they're connected as part of the same. 
Um, I'm guessing it's possible to do it across multiple networks. And if so, how much complicated does it get? Uh, yeah, this is yeah. Also, if if we go here to this yeah, to this link, you can see all the possibilities. It is possible. Yeah, it's like the similar question to the one before. You need to deploy an east-west gateway because you don't have direct communication to the API server, so you must do a pass-through uh, to the ADS gateway. It ah. depends about complexity, it depends on the number of clusters you have. So uh, if you have 10 clusters and you want to do complex routing between one of them, yeah, then it's, it becomes a bit complicated just to manage the objects. But it's easy to do for uh, for just traffic, but if you then want to implement uh, poly policies like JOT policies, uh, rate limiting, then it depends the, on the number of clusters you have. The more, the more complex. But definitely, it is uh, possible, and it I have seen it in many places. Many customers have this. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. And sorry for the duplicate question. Sorry. Could you just put the GitHub link up one more time? Yes. There it is. That one, right? Yes, thank you. If there are any issues, just open an issue, okay, and we will have, we will try to address or just solve your question. So, yeah. Okay, any other questions? You can also ask offline, okay, or just in our social media. So, thank you everyone for attending. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.